So thanks everyone for for joining us uh, for the uh, the narratives of failure and hope. Um, this is sort of an, an outtakes blooper reel or more, uh, you know, just getting to know Jessica and I as we pull this project together. So this project is the result of about three, four, maybe even more years of thinking on the subject of failure and vulnerability and hope and growth and, and all of those sorts of topics. Um, and so Jessica and I were, were lucky enough to receive funding from the Soul Grant Program through uh, STLHE. Um, and as a result, we got talking about uh, all of these sort of difficult subjects or, or, or hidden subjects within higher education. Um, and just as we were about to sort of launch a wonderful project along came this global pandemic. So courtesy of COVID-19, um, we've sort of had another two years to think about this and think about what we really wanted as meaningful outcomes from this project. So not just a journal article or something boring like that or a conference presentation. Um, and that's where we really landed on this series of conversations, this uh, series of um, just discussions, narratives, riffing off of one another with, with our colleagues from all over the world. And as a result of COVID-19, we all got way more comfortable on Zoom and, and here we are. So. The other piece that, that Jessica and I thought about was it, it's not really fair to ask these questions of all of our good friends unless we ask them of ourselves. So what you're going to see in the next, uh, the next few minutes is sort of a, a rapid fire succession of responses to the same questions from Jessica and I. And so I guess I get to go first with the questions. Oh, no. Yeah, here you go. So. Jessica, uh, what keeps you up at night or what gets you out of bed in the morning in relation to teaching and learning? Um, you know, are they the same thing? Are they different things? What does it sort of um, showcase? Thanks, Pat. And I think that the answer changes depending on, you know, the moment of, of failure, the moment of, of um, us on a trajectory of, of change. And what I love about um, you and I having conversations, not just with each other, but also with 3M fellows across Canada is finding the outliers and innovators and normalizing failure and despair as part of the process, that it's not a bug of the process, it's not a flaw, but it's actually part of the system, right? As you go and you think, how can I make this better, more inclusive, more equitable, more just? And then you you sort of get your, your people together and you sort of get something in, in the works and then you go and try it and you inevitably or inevitably in my case, get shot down, right? Or blocked or defeated. And you sort of pick yourselves back up because it becomes intensely personal when you believe that something is gonna make the, the lives of students better or the lives of equity deserving groups better or the lives of your colleagues better, um, you've got a lot invested. You've got a lot of your sort of personal um, identity tied up to making the world a better place, which sounds super Pollyanna, but in fact is <laughs> I think what we're trying to do in education um, and within our institutions and our disciplines. So, you know, I think what keeps me up at night is working through the, the wicked problems, the complexity of change and, and trying to figure out where those levers of change are and where inevitably we mess up. We can't imagine the brick wall that we're gonna run into. We can't imagine the cliff we accidentally fall off. And that's the thing that keeps me up at three in the morning. Um, but the thing that gets me up out of bed is also that, right? This is a wicked problem. You've got to, to name it. You've got to understand the shape of it. You've got to find a way to intervene there. And usually it's a sort of like, okay, you felt sorry for yourself at three in the morning, but at seven in the morning, you've got to dust yourself off and, and go back out into the world and try again. And that's not a, an absence of howling into the abyss. It's like howling into the abyss and then moving it into laughter into the abyss and just getting ready to, to get back out there. So <laughs> it changes the, the particular wicked problem sometimes changes, but that like sort of cycle of despair and hope for me is something that, um, that recurs. But what about you, Pat? Like what, what keeps you up at night and, and what gets you out of bed in the morning? I think the thing that keeps me up at night is really 
how to juggle all the balls, right? So it's it's this this necessity of flexibility, right? It's the, you know, now that I've spent 17 years as a prof, I, I'm I'm looked at as some sort of educational leader. And how do I juggle those balls? Or how do I solve the problems, also be inspiring, keep my own um, mental health put together? Um, you know, just all of those pieces together are what what keep me up at night, right? Just the lots on your plate, um, trying not to drop it, but inevitably you will drop some of it. And that's the notion of failure. And I and I feel, you know, quite quite privileged and I recognize my privilege in this sphere as a middle-aged white man um, that that I have the privilege and the ability to to let some of these fall and pick them back up again and dust myself off and and figure out how to make it better the next time because i feel like what gets me out of bed in the morning is if i go to bed and i have all this sort of like ah too many things on my plate what gets me up in the morning is the like aha i had a great light bulb moment and now i know how to solve this and now i know how to solve that and it's usually not for me it's it's something else to assist someone else or uh or sort of modify something that I tried five years ago or completely throw out something I tried last week. Um, it's just the excitement of trying new things. I love that that image of like the the balls in the air and managing them. And one of the best pieces of advice I got in the middle of the global pandemic, managing intense, you know, professional convergences, but also our, our personal lives where we have young children, where we have partners, where we have the complexities of, of just living in the world. And, and um, Shannon Murray, a 3M fellow from 2001 said, figure out which balls are rubber and figure out which balls are glass and let the rubber ones bounce, let them fall. And I just, that for me was a sort of light bulb moment where I was like, right, most of them are rubber. And in fact, the ones that are glass are, as you say, Pat, your mental health, your well being, the health and safety of your children and of your family. Um, and to have enough resilience and enough energy in your tank to be able to get back up in the morning and to try again. Well, so that's that's it exactly. The, the enough in your tank to be able to get up and 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 do it again, because quite often it's it's the same thing. It's the same thing, and 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 having the resilience to be able to walk through that door um, when you when you half expect or or just completely assume um, that the same the same outcome is going to happen. So resilience, I'm going to pick up on that term because we have heard a lot about resilience over the last two years, and we've heard a lot about how to get gritty and bounce back and build back better. And, you know, all of the different kinds of phrases are around persistence or academic buoyancy, often related to our students. And we don't see the same conversations happening about staff and faculty members and administrators. But one of the, the things I think that has shifted for me over the course of the last two years is more attention or being at least more attentive to the narratives of resilience at the individual level and shifting that to a systems level. So how do we stop asking people to be more resilient and get out of bed in the morning in deteriorating conditions? And how do we actually reframe those system structures and policies so people don't have to be resilient? We hear a lot about like, how is the institution resilient? Which usually means how is it going to continue to recruit and you know stay in the black and not post deficits? But that's not what I mean. How do you create systems that allow people to be resilient and flourish at, in communion with one another? And so that's sort of sparked my thinking around Hope University and a book project that I'm working on, but intimately related to some of the conversations you and I have about failure and despair. Mm -hmm. So if you were to build Hope University with the idea of resilient systems, so individuals don't have to be, what are one or two easy, low-hanging pieces of fruit that you could just point to, to say, no, this is where I would start? To me, the number one thing centers around flexibility and centers on, on humanizing the university, right? And that, that, that could be everything and, and nothing altogether. But what I really mean by that is just, you know, there's a level of empathy 
that we're, we're all human. I don't know what's going on in your life. You don't know what's going on in my life. But at the end of the day, do I need to keep you here until 4.30 when you've had to go, jump through hoops to get childcare for your kid? But if you left at four o'clock, that would be fine. And Or can I just be a little bit more human and say, you know what, what matters to me? This report, this deliverable, I, I, I sort of, you know, if you send me an email at seven o'clock at night, because that's when it's easiest for you, because you've put your kid to bed, then, then by all means. And if you had to, you know, leave the office from one to two, um, that's what you had to do. And, and I think we've learned some of that flexibility because the pandemic has made us learn that flexibility when so many of us were working at home, juggling kids in online learning, managing all the like constant runny noses that meant that they couldn't go to daycare or whatever else. We just realized, you know, at the end of the day, the university didn't fall over when we started doing Senate meetings on Zoom. The university didn't fall over when we, when we were more flexible and more caring. Mm. So why don't we just do that from now on? And, and that could permeate all kinds of things like tenure and promotion processes, um, you know, teaching workload related conversations, um, how we position sort of research and travel and, and things like that into the day-to-day -day job of a scholar. But what does your Hope University look like, Jessica? Oh my God, Pat, you're asking me as I'm in the middle of writing this book, <laughs> I am 40,000 words in. So I'm feeling like I'm halfway through and I'm in the despair stage because I think how in God's name or God, the gods, the classical gods or whomever you, you yell at when you're mad can, yeah. can one person pull together all of those different threads. And it feels like Sisyphus sort of rolling that that big boulder up the hill and then having to do it over and over again, it, it feels overwhelming. And so um, I sit in, in the discomfort of that, recognizing that no one human can build Hope University, that, that hope has to build, be built in, as Paulo Freire says, in communion with the other. So this entire project is animated by, I'm, I'm a facilitator, not a um, <laughs> the designer, where I'm convening conversations with you and award-winning educators but also hosting hope summits and focus groups and workshops where we're looking at it from where people are. So we're going to where people are in their own context and asking them those questions. So for me, that the fundamental is in communion with other. Bell Hook says that healing can only happen in communion with, in, with others. And I, I feel like part of the Hope University is to be able to sit in the discomfort of not knowing, sit in the grief of what has happened to us and of the recognition that our systems right now are inhospitable, that they're impervious, that they are not welcoming, that they are not built on our fundamental values of empathy, compassion, consent, and community. That what we say we are as institutions of higher learning and how we actually do that in practice, there's a gap there and I feel that that gap is widening. Mm -hmm. So the ways in which I build Hope University, not just as a thought experiment, but as a daily practice and anchoring it in our every day is to facilitate and bring into conversation diverse thought partners. And so, you know, that's how you build it is you build it where you, where you are, you meet people where they are and you give them trust and self-determination and sovereignty and deep love and you ask them those questions and then you listen and you listen with the intention to transform and how that, that sort of manifests itself, as you say, can, can permeate every aspect of our institutions, our structures, our policies, and our systems. That's everything from, do we grade to, do we charge tuition to, do we, um, you know, review people's research or contributions in different kinds of ways, but we start with that values-based leadership and we understand that we don't know and that we have to start asking with some curiosity and imagination to be able to do better. So I'm going to throw a question back at you though, Pat. <laughs> All right. I, 
I love your work on failure and I love the work that you do with your cohort, um, with the 3M fellows, how you model it, how you are so candid in, in spaces and you're willing to have candid conversations in contested spaces. And I just, I want to think about with you how hope doesn't happen in the absence of despair. It happens because of despair. It happens in our relationships and our lived experiences with failure. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about maybe one experience of, of failure, whether that's in your professional or personal life, um, and how you sort of sit, sit in the shit, sit in the discomfort, and then how you, how you manage it to proverbially get out of bed in the morning and, and keep going. It's a, it's a question that I've thought a lot about, but but I don't want to use sort of the same examples that I've used elsewhere. So I was just sort of trying to think of a new one, and and I, and I feel like if if anything, the 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 COVID nineteen pandemic has taught us like a lot of shit can go sideways, right? And and it's pretty easy to get in a space where it's all down, down, down. Oh. I hate teaching online. Oh, there's no way I want to come back because I don't feel safe on campus. Oh, you're going to make me teach in a hybrid or high flex um, modality. And so for me, one of the big pieces um, is, is that, you know, I come from an inherently hands-on field-based um, discipline, right? So I come from outdoor education um, and, you know, Jumping into the online teaching sphere was never an easy sell, but it was one that I stumbled and fumbled and muddled and fuddled my way through for probably 15 years. Mm. So I was in a pretty good place when the pandemic came along, trying to like inspire folks or say, well, here's a whole bunch of lessons that I learned over the last 13 years that made things really difficult. So don't do what I do, or don't do what I did. Um, so, so some of my failures were just around, you know, lack of engagement with the students in the online sphere, which which has become better and better. And 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 I had a really good um, experience about five years ago teaching an entire course on Facebook. Now, this was before Facebook got in trouble for all of their privacy concerns, so it wouldn't work quite the same now, but it was one of the most engaging courses that I ever had, period, face-to-face, -face, online, anything, because it was so easy for the students to connect with the course material, because like they would see something flash up in a magazine on Facebook and pop that over into the class space. And then 12 students would chat, chat about it for the next three days and someone else would pop something in there. And, you know, that doesn't even happen in many of my face-to-face -face courses. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really been neat, just the ability to experiment and the ability to mm -hmm. try things out in little doses, right? Like not do... Mm -hmm egregious overhauls of courses but what if I did this and what if I did this and and I re and I recognize that some of that comes from my positionality right as a tenured faculty member um, who has gone through the system and and in in many ways because of my 3M national teaching fellow oh that's Pat what he does must be good he, he's allowed to experiment more so than others because that gives it some credibility so so I, in a roundabout way, lots of my failures in the online sphere just led up to this like I, it's not a glorious moment but the silver lining in the pandemic is the fact that you know i'd had some growth over a number of years because i wasn't afraid to take risks because i wasn't afraid to fail yeah so how about you same same question <laughs> how, i guess or, or or a flip from the question right like how have you grown from mm. failures in your mm -hmm. in your teaching or in your practice well you know i think that i you know i fail and all the time and spectacularly and i fail um you know i failed in my first year as an undergraduate i actually dropped out of university before i failed out and i um was a very different kind of student depending on this base and stage of my trajectory. Right. Um, but, 
you know, the, this is a lesson that the universe continues to ask me to learn is to sit in the vulnerability and to sit in the lesson and to transform. And so, you know, just as you say, well, you know, we've, we've got privilege as 3M National Teaching Fellows that we can play and experiment. It's also been a, a life-changing and transformative experience to realize that what I know as an educational leader doesn't always translate into being a good boss. And so how do you build a team thinking that you can use the same skills in the classroom or thinking you can use the same skills as an educational leader, but build a team that is connected, that feels supported, trusted, loved, and mentored through um, this, this difficult time. So I, I had a sort of deep failure as my first foray into being a boss, um, into thinking that it was just a mentorship of a student, um, right? And reproducing those those dynamics and those power relationships without being really intentional about them. And so I had to sit in that discomfort and sort of teach myself organizational behavior and how to be a boss, how to manage a team, how to develop a team, how to create communications, how to have social norms that are respectful and joyful and mutually enriching for everybody. And so I learned and grow, grew tremendous amounts over the last two years as I sort of had to unlearn some of the things that I learned as an educational leader and as a pedagogue, but had to sort of really rethink in terms of what are the logistics of building a team and, you know, having upskilled conversations for bad behavior and how to do performance reviews and evaluation in ways that are generous and, and joyful and, but also difficult. And so um, I've grown tremendously and I have a chapter in the Hope University book about why transformative leaders sometimes make really bad bosses. And I speak about that, <laughs> that in my own and to sit with that vulnerability and to sit and listen to these podcasts about like, yeah, okay. How do you do this? How do you make sure that shame isn't baked into the walls as you're running a hundred miles an hour in one direction has been a really, really powerful learning experience, but it, it was grounded in failure and despair and heartache. And then the vulnerability to be able to transform through that process. It's really interesting that you say that Jessica, because I, I feel like this is another, um, large scale fault of our current higher education system, which is you did a PhD. It was about research. And now we plunk you into a place that is not 100% about research. It's about research and teaching and service and a million other things. But it's also the, the piece about, you know, as one grows through their academic career and they're expected to be a leader or an administrator or a boss, right? We don't necessarily give people the appropriate tools to be able to do this. And, and I've only recently realized that there's a lot of value in, you know, executive education courses and things like that, that really speak to that job to which I am now expected to perform at, at, at a university. I'm not in the classroom as much as I would like to be as the dean of teaching. Um, I'm not doing as much research as I would necessarily like to be as an as an active scholar. But but my training has never taught me these sort of these sort of skills. And so I I, I think it's uh it it is a conversation about not necessarily about failure, but about vulnerability. What what do I not know that I don't know. Yeah. Well, and you know, Pat, part of the thing that I started to do to sort of own that discomfort is I took up a hobby in COVID. I started to paint and I started to paint without any background in um, art and without any training and without any classes. And I had bought my kids a bunch of acrylics and, and canvases. They were four and six when the lockdown happened. And so we spent a lot of time together getting creative. I thought, let's, let's do this. Let's sort of uh, and I'll sit next to them and be a learner. And so as I started to make bad art and I, I have to be <laughs> bad at it, like I have to be, it has to be something that I can't master because um, we try to master things like in higher education, right? We're overachievers, but I had to sit and be bad at it. And I was listening to a series of podcasts as I was painting. And one of them 
brought me to tears because it gave me a language that I didn't have before. And it was Brene Brown's podcast episode on um, daring versus armored leadership. And what I realized in higher education is we create armored leadership, that everything has to look perfect. It is a product. It is impervious. It is rigorous, whatever that means. Rigorous also is rigor mortis, right? It is inflexible. It is inhospitable, that it values lines on the CV, uh, but doesn't teach us how to do the human stuff that we need to, to build communities of practice. And so Renee Brown was talking about how daring leadership, which is brave and messy and vulnerable and open and full of heart, but full of failure comes up and collides against armored leadership, which looks for metrics and ROIs and shiny two-page reports by consultants being paid exorbitant amounts of money to tell them things that they're going to discard. And what we've done is because people have been, as you said, sort of promoted through the ranks in ways that they're actually promoted beyond their skill set. You know, neuroscientist is not taught about, you know, um, emotional and social intelligence and building a team around performance as assessment, or a chemist is not taught how to run collegial governance at the joint, you know, table around a grievance. And yet we've promoted these people into positions where they're deeply uncomfortable and woefully ill-equipped to manage the the human nature, the human formula that is our, our institution. And so um, often they reproduce armored leadership because that's what they see. And they see those systems and structures and, and use those to bludgeon out the human. And so, you know, I can look at that and be like, oh, you know, those those silly people or those, un, you know, uninformed or critically unreflective humans. And then I go and do it myself right? Where I'm like, educational leadership makes me a great leader in any context. It doesn't translate. And so <laughs> I think sitting in that and being vulnerable in that and asking people to think about that wherever they are, whether they are a you know junior faculty member, a precarious contract faculty member, a first year student, or a president of a university, to think about those those concepts of vulnerability and of critical reflective practice and of, of modeling that has a huge knockdown effect on everybody else who are like, oh, maybe, maybe I can also admit I don't know this and I need to work on conflict resolution or upskill for difficult conversation or build my, my wheelhouse in project management or um, change management. And so- mm -hmm. There's a lot of, as you say, there's a lot of places where we've got to be able to say, we don't know, we don't even know that. And I, and I think the strength there is really in the reflective piece and being conscious of, you know, I, I think about um, when I teach my classes, I, I don't go in there trying to be the sage on the stage, right? And, and I don't do the flipped classroom because it's the new sexy buzzword that's come out of, you know, left field. I sort of, I teach because of the way that I had great teachers, right? And so, you know, try, try to do what they did that, that I found valuable and, and, and not do um, what they did. And I, and I found to, to, to not be of value. I, I feel like the more that we can say, you know, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure. I'll try to figure it out. I'll take some training in that. Heaven forbid, as a faculty member, I might actually ask a staff member who that's what they're good at. Um, uh, you know, I, I think these are the conversations that we need to have in, in higher ed. And, and if anything, um, the pandemic has, has pushed us a little quicker up that hill <laughs> than, than, than we otherwise would have. So final question then, and this is one that I haven't worked out because we're not yet post COVID, but the intersections between failure and hope of, of despair and of learning and of transformation, we've changed dramatically in the last years. And I think you're right. We've accelerated our, our sort of learning processes. How has this changed? If you can think about sort of pre COVID present circumstance and then looking towards a post because at some point we're going to be post COVID, <laughs> right like give me some throw me a bone here of hope that we're going to like move into that space but if we've got those three stages for you what is 
what or how has the relationship changed for you between failure and hope that the global pandemic has taught you? I, I feel like um, I feel like I've become more hopeful through this global pandemic. Not and, and maybe that's slightly changed given we've now got the this situation in the Ukraine and and things like this. But I think related to the pandemic, I feel like I've become more hopeful because you know. I recognize we were all in the same storm, but we were in different boats and my boat was pretty good, right? Like I, I held down a job and my family stayed happy and healthy. Um, and, you know, I could work from home and, and things like that. So, so I feel hopeful that some of those wonderful traits like flexibility of working, um, work from home, uh, et cetera, will con continue. I think, I think it's maybe more so changed my outlook on failure, though, because I kind of don't like, apart from the gigantic, colossal failure that, you know, like a building exploded or something like that, most failures, I wouldn't call failures anymore. They're just stops on a spectrum. They're stops on a bus route. They're, they're a, when this happens, it was a minor mistake. I tried this out. It didn't work. Um, they're just, they're, they're, yeah, they really are like bus stops going up a hill towards the, the end goal. And so that really, I think, has, has changed because I would have seen some things as you know, minor failures or major failures. But to me, failure is something that I now would, would reserve for the big, the colossal. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that for me as well, that it's a failure of imagination, a failure of critical reflection, a failure of critical empathy, a failure of challenging the actual in the name of the possible for me that's that's failure it's not the lumps and bumps and messes and and yeah. you know brick walls that i just mixed all of my metaphors as a literature professor they're just super fun <laughs> but, but, I, but i think it's it's also about like it, it's about creativity right it's about it's about just like this thing happened and and past pat would have said, oh my gosh, that's a big issue. But current Pat says, well, how can I spin that? Or how can I roll with that? Or, or what does that bring to the table that's good? Mm -hmm. And then that takes future Pat to, to a much better place. Because, you know, if we never failed, then, you know, that would be the most detrimental piece. I agree. I agree. And, you know, I, I'm, I think the answer to, to that question about how has COVID changed the way in which our, our relationship to failure and hope has, has manifested. I am so much more attentive to how people tell stories about mm. things and how they narrativize their place in the world and the place that they're going. And so I'm really attuned to critical hope, which as you say, acknowledges and invites into the conversation transformation and discomfort and says, hey, guess what? We're just figuring this out as we go. And we are adapting and upcycling and changing all of the time. So critical hope for me is marking the space for our transformation and the discomfort that we know comes with that. It always hurts when you, when you evolve, when you transform evolutionary biology, in stories and plays, it hurts when we transform, but that doesn't mean it's a bad piece. It just means we have to mark it and frame it. And so for me, the failure is if we go back to normal and we tell stories, we tell narratives that are for me, um, I've called them toxic positivity, that we refuse to acknowledge that we've learned, grown, transformed and hurt. Yeah. And if we can eschew those narratives. Cause that's, that's the easy thing, right? Let's go back to stasis. Let's go back to what it was because maybe it'll hurt less if we can go back to normal and that isn't possible. Well, and I just think so, there, so there's, there's two quotes from Nelson Mandela, right? Who's arguably sort of someone who's lived through the most 
in, in our time and, and it's probably one of the greatest storytellers too. And the fact that we are in higher education, I think just speaks to these quotes, right? So education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world, right? So let's, let's use it. Let's figure out what we can do with higher education and move forward and change the world for, for the better. But also we have to think about the fact that the greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall, right? And that's the little bits and pieces of picking yourself up, dusting yourself off, and moving along to the place that you want to be. Yeah. And creating systems where somebody will give you a hand and pull you up and a system will allow you to fail and bounce you back up, right? So that, yeah. yes, there is an important to cultivate resilience as an individual trait, but we have to think about the systems yeah. and the, the entire ecosystem that makes that failure um, safer, more transformative, less dangerous, so that you can go on that journey, both as an individual and in communion with others. And I think that that is something that we've, we've learned and I think resonates in our conversation is that we can't do this on our own. We have to do it in conversation with others. We have to do it with compassion and consent and a deep, deep um, honoring of our communities in all of their diverse and inclusive spaces and, and um, intersections. So Pat, thank you. We, we, there we are. We, we, we did, did it. it. We well, asked each other the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited as we go on this journey, as we embark upon it, what we're going to learn and what kinds of threads we can pull from people in really different spaces, in different kinds of models of institution, large and small, comprehensive, research intensive, but also across Canada, in Europe, in Australasia, and in the global South. And I'm just so grateful to be able to learn alongside you on this um, curiosity-driven adventure. Excellent. Well, it's a wonderful journey to be on. 